Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Isaiah chapter 52, and we're going to look at the first 12 verses leading up to the sermon text. And the sermon text is going to span the boundary between chapter 52 and the beginning of chapter 53, because I believe that those two passages and two separate chapters really are more cohesive. Uh, and so we're going to look at the first 12 verses to set us up for that. Look at this. Wake up, wake up, put on your strength, Zion, put on your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer enter you. Stand up, shake the dust off yourself, take your seat, Jerusalem, remove the bonds from your neck, captive daughter Zion. So in, uh, in this text, we see this theme, wake up, wake up. We've seen that same wake up theme come in chapter 51, verse 9 and 17, chapter 50, verse 4. It's another one of these calls to wake up. And we can see that there's this, this transition from slavery to royalty. Uh, shake the dust off your feet, take your seat. All right, that seat sort of sounds like a, a throne. Uh, remove the bonds from your neck because you're no longer a slave. You're no longer captive. Uh, for this is what the Lord says, you were sold for nothing and you will be redeemed without silver. So God had said that he would, uh, that he would, he would sell basically Israel, uh, the remnant, the remnant of Judah. Uh, they, they would be dominated by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians. And, uh, now because he, you know, it, it's like in a transaction. If I didn't, if I gave it away for free, I can take it back for free is kind of the idea. And, and they're, they're, they're no longer captive. They're no longer going to be uh, under the thumb of the Babylonians. But this is Isaiah writing from the perspective of the future, looking back on it, because the Babylonian captivity had yet to take place. And Isaiah is talking about it already as though it were past tense. You get, you get this, this long captivity, but he's already looking beyond the other side of it. For this is what the Lord God says, at first, my people went down to Egypt to reside there. Then Assyria oppressed them without cause. So, now, what have I here? This is the Lord's declaration, that my people are taken away for nothing. It's rulers wail. This is the Lord's declaration, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. We're going to look at how this verse is, uh, is quoted in the New Testament. All right, so we're going to come back to that, but I want you to see the whole passage first. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, they will know on that day that I am he who says... Here I am. Okay, now these two words, if you're a student of the Old Testament and if you, you remember the book of Exodus, you know that, uh, and you know the Gospel of John, you were with us when we did our study in John. Those are, those are profound words to, to refer to oneself as the I am. They're going to they're gonna see their God. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the herald who proclaims peace, who brings news of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Uh, this is an exciting moment uh, for my bride, Jesse. Jesse, uh, my, my beautiful wife, I love you. This is, your, this is one of your favorite verses, all right, especially as, as Paul would quote it uh, in Romans 10, 15, which we'll, we'll look at in, in just a moment. The voices of your watchmen, they lift up their voices, shouting for joy together, for every eye will see when the Lord returns to Zion. Be joyful, rejoice together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has displayed his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. All the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Leave, leave, go out from there. Do not touch anything unclean. Go out from her. Purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. We're going to look at another reference to this same thing. This is about the upcoming Babylonian captivity as the subsequent generation would then leave captivity. They would be forbidden from bringing anything from Babylon with them. Okay, when you come out of uh, when you come out of captivity, particularly in the New Testament sense, to sin, for example, don't take, don't take a bunch of habits back with you into your new Christian life. You're going to find that they don't fit well. <laughs> for you will, not, uh, you will not leave in a hurry, and you will not have to take flight, because the Lord is going before you, and the God of Israel is your rear guard. You can, you can take your time walking out of captivity. So the Lord is giving this incredibly good news. He's telling them that their deliverance is coming. 
and he's talking about the way he's already talking about the walk back home, the leisurely stroll back home because he's already prophesied how he's going to do it. He's going to establish some king named Cyrus who hasn't been born yet, but he's going to establish the Persian Empire who's going to conquer media and the Medo-Persian Empire is going to be a pretty dominant force. God's going to use them multiple times to deliver the Israelites and all of this, all of this, all of this is for God's own glory. Okay, none of this is because Israel particularly did anything to deserve it. All of it is all of it is about God's glory. So, verse 5, we see this come up in the New Testament. Let's take a look at just some of the cross references I've 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 given you here. In Romans chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, you who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Here, Paul was rebuking the, the hyper-legalistic Pharisees who were eager to point out short, shortcomings in others while they themselves harbored massive sin. They were eager to tell people not to steal while they were stealing. They were eager to tell people not to commit adultery while they may have committed adultery. And, and he's saying, this, is bla this blasphemes the name of God among the Gentiles, uh, and it's all because of you. And he's quoting, uh, he's quoting verse 5 of Isaiah 52. It comes here, and then it, and then it shows fulfillment in the New Testament in Romans chapter 2. All right, uh, there's more New Testament stuff here. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 9 echoes kind of what I was saying before about this passage, how God's just going to set them free and deliver them, and it's all going to be for His glory. But I acted for the sake of my name so that it would not be profaned in the eyes of the nations they were living among, in whose sight I had made myself known to Israel by bringing them out of Egypt. So God, God does all of this not because the his Old Testament chosen people were particularly well behaved. Over and over again, for example, further on in uh, in the book of Ezekiel, he says over and over again how he's going to bring them back to their own land, and he's going to do this so that we would then look upon it and know that he alone is the Lord God, and above him there is no other. Romans ten fifteen. Here it is. This is what quotes today's text as well, and uh, that's why that's what appears bold in this text. How can they preach unless they are sent? Now, you might remember this if you were a part of uh, some of our past series. For example, when we did, uh, we did the Sacred Conversation series and we did uh, Behold the Harvest, I think the same passage came up in both of those series, that how can they call upon the God they've not believed in? How can they believe unless they hear? How can they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And that brings us right here to a quote from today's text of Isaiah chapter 52. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Man, this is, uh, this is exquisite. This is beautiful. Uh, in, in Romans, Paul quotes, uh, Paul quotes from the book of Isaiah. And isn't it cool, too, that it's the same chapter uh, where we see the, uh, the fourth and the most popular of the servant songs? Did you know that those verses came immediately before the text of this weekend's sermon uh, describing the suffering servant, describing Christ on the cross 700 years before he was born? Here's something else that I wanted to show you. In the interest of time, I won't be able to delve into it too much, but in, uh, in 2 Corinthians, when, uh, when Paul is describing uh, describing the differences between righteousness and lawlessness and uh, how this actually this is this is why you know uh, even though it's biblically permissible for pastors to uh, officiate weddings between two non-christians um, we are in violation of this teaching when we officiate weddings between a Christian and a non-christian right uh, there, there may be churches that have clear policies and you know uh, when it comes to their their refusal to, to to perform or host same sex weddings, but this is something that's often overlooked by churches that uh, you're not to yoke together a Christian and a non Christian. Uh, for what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? It's sort of like Baal, Baal. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Uh, we've already studied this in our, our series, uh, The God of All Comfort, 
But here you see something that looks pretty familiar. Therefore, come out from among them. Isaiah 52, it's about Israel coming home from their captivity in Babylon and be separate, says the Lord, do not touch any unclean thing and I will welcome you. So uh, Paul is taking that same Old Testament principle and then he's applying it in the New Testament context. He's promising to bring his people home and he's saying, leave all that stuff behind. Okay, leave all of that stuff behind. You, as a New Testament believer, can look at this text and you can apply it the way that Paul did to the New Testament believer's life, that you leave behind your sinful ways. Now, every one of us stumbles in, in, a, uh, in, in a number of ways. Every one of us is going to, at some point, fail and give into temptation. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is not an excuse. In fact, we are without excuse. Even when we're tempted, God provides a way for us to stand up under it. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. However, as we do, uh, as as we as we do live out the Christian life, should we give in to temptation? It's so important that we get up right away, that we repent right away, that we turn back to the Lord immediately, that you confess your sin to those to whom you're accountable, and you leave it behind. You not go back again. This was equivalent to the people of Israel now coming out of captivity. Why would they want to bring souvenirs from captivity? Okay, you, you as a Christian, you were in captivity to sin, and now you've been set free, and you've been called home with the Lord. Don't bring any souvenirs from your sinful life. Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, if anything causes you to stumble, cut it out and throw it away. Don't bring any, uh, don't bring any sin souvenirs along with you. You are a child of God and he's called you home. Amen. Hey, I will see you tomorrow at the Redemption Church.